Now, chapter five, broker operations, activities, and procedures. Okay, so I just jumped right in. We covered previously co-mingling of funds, the escrow account, signage, things of that nature. Now let's deal with some other operation procedures as it relates to chapter five and re relates to the broker. Brokers must notify Fred in writing of conflict demands of a, whenever there's a good faith doubt within 15 days of an escrow. For instance, there's a claim against escrow for whatever reason. Now, if the broker had it with a title company or attorney, then Freck is not involved because they're not regulated. They don't regulate attorneys or title company. But when the broker has a, deep, a, deep, a good faith question or debate, who's entitled to the funds? Maybe there's a claim, the seller wants their money, the buyer wants their money back because they, they didn't close the deal for whatever reason, and they want their escrow money, money, earnest money deposit and move on to another property. And the seller says the buyer defaulted. I have a right to that claim. The broker, he can make a decision, but if he's wrong, he can be disciplined by FRAC. He has 15 days when there's a conflict of demand to notify FRAC. And, and FRAC has already predetermined. He has four possible outcomes. You can learn it by mail. I believe we covered it before in the review of the chapter, mail. Mediation, arbitration, litigation, mm -hmm. and escrow disbursement order. Mediation, both parties would have to agree. It's non-binding and it takes, takes the recommendation um, of the mediator. Arbitration, both parties agree and it's binding. The arbitrator comes with a binding decision. Deposit goes to the seller, deposit does not go to the buyer or vice versa. Litigation speaks for itself. Litigation is one part, they cannot agree, one party can take it to court for the claim against the escrow proceeds. And I believe there's two types. I'm talking off the top of my head. Those who have the book in hand or access to the internet can correct Professor, Professor B if I'm off base. But I believe it's this, litigation, you have an interpleader and a declaratory judgment. The interpleader is if the broker, if the broker himself has no claim for the earnest money deposit that's under dispute, mm -hmm. he's simply an interpleader, simply an interpleader, and the courts would decide who's entitled to the proceeds. Declaratory judgment, it could be a case twenty thousand dollars on the dispute, or hundred thousand dispute, some big numbers. And the broker says, "Well, I did everything I was supposed to, and this buyer backed out for whatever reason. So just if the seller want to claim on that hundred thousand, the broker say, "Well, I have whatever expenses associated. I fulfill certain terms of my agreement. You just chose not to move forward and acquire the property, and I'm owed twenty thousand, thirty thousand. So then the broker, it would go to litigation, obviously." And the declaratory judgment, the judgment, the broker will be seeking a judgment for his share of the commission or his share of services that he may have earned. Mm -hmm. That would be declaratory judgment when the broker has an interest, a broker financial interest in, in the court's finding. Mm -hmm. And then the final one will be an escrow disbursement order. An escrow disbursement order comes from FREC. And FREC, basically it's FREC giving the instructions as to who should get the money, get the money, and how should it be dispersed? And as long as the broker follows one of these settlement procedures when, with conflicts of demand, and particularly escrow disbursement order, there will be no pushback or no consequences to the broker. Okay. okay. Uh, some real, um, rental lists, I'll just say, I don't want to belabor that. Rental lists, Real estate companies down here in South Florida, it may vary throughout statewide. Down here in South Florida, it's probably highly improbable that brokers are charging for rental lists. Mm -hmm. However, rental lists, if you uh, uh, basically from if the if if the if the list is uh, if the list is inaccurate, failure to provide a current list a current rental list, uh, the broker first of all the buyer is entitled to one hundred percent refund. And if you charge a fee for that rental list, mm -hmm. you could be subject to a thousand dollar fine. And I believe a first degree misdemeanor. So those are very serious consequences just for providing a rental list. Even though that inadvertent that you provided inaccurate rental data. Mm -hmm. So what's the solution? Not saying don't do rentals, because a lot of realtors, great realtors, they make a living servicing buyers or, or tenants, or 
prospective tenants who are seeking housing on a rental basis. Just don't provide the list. Go in the MLS, find what you have, show them around, find out what they're looking for, and make your commission a service to the general public accordingly. Mm -hmm. But there are severe fines for an accurate rental list. 100% refund anything that you may have charged for the rental list, mm -hmm. and a $1,000 misdemeanor. A $1,000 uh, uh, fine and subject to a misdemeanor and one year in jail. So a misdemeanor can go up to one year in jail. <laughs> but we want to spoke, uh, speak on the positive things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> A kickback, what is a kickback? A kickback is when you give proceeds to someone as part of a transaction. And typically kickback has a negative connotation. It's a negative connotation. You gave money to some, um, to a transaction. Mm -hmm. So the obvious question, who's allowed to receive legal kickback? I don't even like to call it legal kickback, legal compensation. Mm -hmm. Someone who's actually performed a service the appraiser, the title company, the home inspection company actually performed the service, right? And legally entitled and licensed to perform that service. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. The surveyor, the appraiser, surveyor, appraiser, title company. Now, but the major tenant is Florida real estate license law is, un, is illegal to pay someone for performing service of real estate who's not a licensee, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So even if it's your own commission, but they make one exception. The one exception is you can pay the buyer or the seller. A licensee or a broker can pay the buyer or the seller a portion of their commitment if all parties are aware of it, okay? And if it's the buyer, obviously you would have to let the seller know and you would have to let the buyer's lender know that could affect the loan value or the down payment requirement or the closing cost assistance, et cetera. But it is, it is legal. I don't even like to call it kickback. It's just legal. In this case, it wouldn't be legal compensation because the buyer's not working for it, but legal subsidy to provide some assistance out of your portion of the realtor's commission mm -hmm. to the buyer if all parties are aware. Uh, okay. Uh, Florida law, Florida law, and that says Florida law allows the share and part of the commission with the buyer selling a real estate transaction, provided the rebate is disclosed to all interested parties. What type of business entities may register? Okay, basically corporations, LLCs, limited partnerships, uh, sole proprietors. All of these are legal entities in the state. Mm -hmm. And you must be registered with the Department of Business and Professional Regulation and or with the Department of State if you're a corporation, things of that nature. Or you don't even have to be registered at all if you're a sole proprietor. Uh, Professor V Incorporated or Vince, I could read Professor V Realty Incorporated, Corporation, Professor V LLC, Professor V Limited Partnership if I have some partners, or I could just be Vincent Burnett, Licensed Real Estate Broker. All of those is enough to have your brokerage operation. And to and employ broker associates and sell associates. Okay, but what's the point? The point is, I dig a little further. Any of those entities, it's not here in the key guides, but I do want to emphasize this. The statute says the corporation, a broker associate, or a sales associate, cannot be officers of that corporation. For the LLC, they cannot be managing members of the LLC. For, the, for a limited partnership, the broker associate and the sales associate cannot be general partners. They can be limited partners, but they cannot be general partners. And for a sole proprietor, it would be that one broker. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I emphasize that because I want the student to be clear that the relationship between the broker and the broker associate and the sales associate is the employer. I'm the employer. Well, the broker's the employer. Mm -hmm. And they, they're independent contractors under the perusal of the broker. So therefore, if there's an employer-employee relationship exists, they're not going to let their broker associate, that sales associate, be an officer of that corporation, oh. a managing member of the LLC, uh, a general partner of a partnership. And the, the, the double irony is they will let someone who has no knowledge of the real estate industry but maybe a business partner, an investment partner, funding the corporation, mm -hmm. has no interest 
not no interest because they have an interest in the company, mm -hmm. but no expertise in real estate. Mm -hmm. They'll let them be officers or general partners, et cetera, because the employee-employee relationship doesn't exist because they're not licensed. Okay. Okay. Um, and also, I didn't mention, a nonprofit entity is allowed as well. Nonprofit is, as long as they're incorporated, they're the same provision as a corporation. Okay. Okay. Uh, then I said, and it's highlighted right there, an obstacle partnership, a quasi-partnership. Can you read it for me? Uh, okay, I have it. An obstacle, a quasi-partnership. I can never say that word, obstacle. I think that's the one that threw me. Okay, it throws everybody off. I don't know where that word comes from. It's created when actions of two or more persons create the appearance of a partnership. Uh -huh. Licenses who operate as Ostenbu partners may be subject to license suspension. Basically, it's a partnership that's not really a partnership. If you have a partnership, you have a limited partnership that's registered with the state. You have a general partnership that's registered with the state. The also partnership, you have two people, they work together, they advertise together, they share an office space. That The general public would presume that they're partners. Mm -hmm. But it's not really because there's no documentation of such. Okay. So it's a quasi partnership or Austin Boo. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it's illegal. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the point. And then sales associates, which is highlighted, sales associates and broker associates may not be members of the board of directors or officers of a real estate brokerage corporation. And I took a step further. They may not be managing members of the LLC, officers of a corporation, things of that nature, because they're trying to preserve that employer employee relationship between the broker and broker associates and sell associates. Mm -hmm. Sell associates and broker associates are not registered, allowed to register as general partners of a real estate brokerage, general or limited partnership, and which I've already previously covered. So again, chapter five is an important chapter, but as you methodically go through it, study, read, trust your first instinct, mm -hmm. um, and trust your first instinct, particularly after you've studied and read, then there's certainly one you can overcome, and it's a very important chapter on your path to obtaining your Florida real estate license. Good luck, I'm Professor V, Victor Realty Finance Academy. We're mm -hmm. open minds, to open doors. Have a good evening.